I'd like to begin our class by asking God's blessing. Let's pray together. Almighty and gracious Heavenly Father, we rejoice that you are indeed the one who has created all things good. And as we look around us and see the splendor of the heavens, and even as we look at the smallest leaf, we see your glory manifested in all that you have made. And even more than that, as we see how you have moved all things in history to your appointed purpose, even the glory of your son Christ, in whom redemption is brought to all the nations, we, we see your glory in this as well. And so we give you thanks this morning and ask that you would guide and bless us as we seek to study your hand in history, even as you have protected the church and guided and directed it, even in the midst of controversy. We thank you that you are the one who is sovereign in all these things and ask that you would bless us and keep us faithful to you. Uh, we are praying all of this in the name of Christ, the one who has brought us to you. Amen. Okay, um, we're um, trying to catch up from where we left off last week. Uh, we were looking at uh, the monasticism and the papacy, and we looked, um, I think the last slide that we looked at together was um, reflecting upon the contribution of St. Benedict of Nursia, who established an order that was used for very godly purposes, uh, namely an order that established the life in, in the day of the, of the, the monks that were uh, obedient to an abbot in each monastery that was established in this rule of Benedict. Um, and it also ordered all aspects of life, um, the raising of food, the copying of scripture, uh, the receiving as guests, and even as they might be Christ, in that spirit, the, the guest was welcomed. And indeed, in all of these activities, they were employing the communities around them. So we're looking at a diagram of uh, St. Gaul in Switzerland, a Benedictine monastery that shows this orderly structure to the day of the life but all, of, of the monks, but also the, um, the ordering of creation to serve God and the community. <coughs> We, we didn't quite get to the popes, but there's a couple of popes that uh, are commendable in terms of their uh, godly use of their office. Um, and the first of these that we'd like to consider is Pope Leo I, who um, was the Bishop of Rome from 440 to his death in 461. He was a good theologian. He read Augustus, uh, um, excuse me, read Augustine, the, uh, the great theologian that we looked at previous weeks, um, Augustine of Hippo, North Africa, who wrote so wonderfully refuting the Pelagian heresy. And when Leo became Pope, the report came to him that some Christians up in Aquilia, northeastern Italy, were Pelagians that were being readmitted without renouncing their, their Pelagian convictions. They were being readmitted to Christian worship. And Leo said that cannot be. Uh, if they don't understand the faith or right, they cannot participate. And so he was uh, a good Augustinian uh, theologian. Um, but he was also known as a, uh, a very thorough writer. He wrote uh, copiously, um, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, well, actually, I don't want to get to it too quickly. Um, during Leo's papacy, in the eastern portion of Christendom, in, particularly in Egypt and other places, um, the nature of Christ's dual, uh, Christ's dual nature. In one person, both 
fully divine and fully human, how do we understand that dual nature of Christ? Um, does he have two wills or one will? A, a human and a divine will or, or a single will? And at least in Egypt and in other places, there were Christians who were saying, oh, well, how can you have two wills in one person? His human will becomes subsumed and absorbed by his divine will. So he really just has one will. So it began to negate the importance and significance of Christ's human will. And um, it became a controversy that was not easily redressed. Uh, Leo wrote to it. His tome of Leo set out what scripture taught, uh, emphasizing, even as we heard this morning in the sermon, uh, how the writer of Hebrews points to Psalm 2, um, this splendor of, of humanity that God intended is being fulfilled in Jesus Christ because he was fully human and, and had a human will. And so uh, Leo and other theologians before him properly exegeted scripture and reaffirmed that. And, it, and yet it still proved to be controversial. And it came to a, such a, a head that a, an ecumenical council at Chalcedon was called in 451. And with Leo's tome as its guide, as well as other theologians that addressed that, um, the council spoke definitively to this question as to how the two natures of Christ are, are, are both respected and uh, sustained. And so this is what was written. We all teach harmoniously that Christ is the same perfect in Godhead, the same perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, the same of a reasonable soul and body, um, of the same substance with the Father in Godhead, and of the same substance with us in manhood, acknowledged in two natures, without confusion, without change, without division, and without separation. So there we have the Council of Chalcedon, 451, clarifying what, what truly is difficult to understand. And perhaps it goes without saying that um, understanding the majesty of God in, even in the person of Jesus Christ is not simple and obvious. So it requires careful consideration. And so, to some extent, Leo and others with him are credited with clarifying and seeing to it that those mistaken notions about Christ's humanity sort of getting dissolved or disappearing uh, were not to be tolerated. Leo was also a very good negotiator. And during his papacy, Attila the Hun threatened to, to vanquish Rome, that great city of such renown. And apparently, Leo, with, with others, apparently um, a representative of, of the um, civil magistrate and the, at the time, uh, went out to meet him. And apparently, Attila the Hun was most impressed with Leo to such an extent. Whatever Leo said, and perhaps even the things that Leo didn't say, the, the, the immediate records have Attila the Hun seeing a vision of an angel with an unsheathed sword standing above Leo and his, and his uh, cohorts, uh, more or less saying, you know, you better not raise your sword against this city. Um, and subsequent uh, descriptions of this also suggest as is depicted here by Raphael in one of the, the frescoes that are in the Vatican celebrating this event in Leo the Life, Leo the First's um, papacy, shows uh, Peter and Paul with their swords drawn. These um, these martyrs of the faith that had died in Rome, they, they had their swords drawn to uh, to threaten Attila the Hun lest he raised his sword against this city. And so, whatever the cause, ultimately. Um, Attila the Hun did not sack Rome at that time, nor any time later. However, that didn't keep Rome safe forever. Apparently, um, this, was, this occurred, uh, uh, this uh, dissuading of Attila occurred in 452. In 455, the Vandals, another group, came. And um, once again, Leo acted as a negotiator 
he wasn't completely effective, but he at least enabled the vandals to avoid sacking any of the basilicas, any of the churches in the city. So at least on two occasions, um, Leo is credited with helping preserve the city of Rome. And I think one of the things that this does with Leo, and, and you know, he's considered among the popes, he's sometimes referred to as Leo the Great, um, in the absence of a unified and central political authority, it appears the pope is the go-to guy. You know, in the lack of, I mean, with all of the fragmentation of the political power, Unlike in the East, you know, in the East, there's no question, um, you know, Constantine had moved the capital there, and, and so the emperor in the East uh, is a clear, powerful person, and no one questions his authority, both in civil or religious affairs. But in the West, because there is no central civil authority, the Pope seems to be the go-to guy, and the fact that twice Leo negotiated for the protection of the city generally, not just the the church, um, this increases the stature of the Pope as a, as a civil authority. And we'll see that that leads to problems eventually. Eventually, we'll have the contest as to who's in charge here. Um, the, when there is a centralized political leader like when the Holy Roman Empire is once again established, we'll see that in today's lesson. But uh, if I don't keep moving here, we won't get to today's lesson. <laughs> so um, we have another Pope to think about, and that is. Um, Gregory the Great, we've got these great popes, uh, and I hope as Protestants we can embrace the idea that there are popes that did do great things by God's grace, not uh, in any uh, human capacity by itself. And another of those that we too look to as having a good contribution to the life of the church is uh, Gregory the First, who um, was the Bishop of Rome from 590 until 604. And one of the great things that he did was establish uh, the first large-scale mission uh, extending from the papacy. Apparently, Gregory was um, himself um, a monk prior to becoming the pope, and a Benedictine monk at that. Bened we just briefly mentioned Benedict had a great influence in terms of establishing a, a rule for for monastic living that was very orderly and very obedient and very much in harmony with scripture. And with that background, Greg <coughs> saw to it that a Benedictine monk by the name of Augustine, and to distinguish him from that previous great Augustine, Augustine, excuse me, I don't know how I'm getting my names mixed up here, but Augustine of, of Canterbury or August, Augustine of Kent, the place where he eventually went to establish Christian witness and bring the gospel to the Anglo, the pagan Anglo-Saxons. Beginning in Kent, because the, the king of Kent uh, was married to a Christian woman, um, though he himself had not yet professed Christianity. So they figured that was a good place to start. And it is in the southeastern section of England. So as you sail across the channel, that would be the place to land. And that mission was successful to such an extent. Um, well, before we even get to the mission there, um, as you can see from this depiction of Pope Gregory, he was a copious writer. Um, he wrote uh, as much as any other Pope up to that time. And one of those volumes that we have recorded in manuscripts from, from the Middle Ages would be um, his commentary on Job, his moralia in Job, finding moral lessons to be found in the book of Job, that you know, challenging um, wisdom book from the Old Testament. And here you see uh, one such manuscript. Um, but here you see um, a manuscript which illustrates um, Gregory sending Augustine of Kent, or Canterbury, if you will, uh, to bring the gospel to the, the British Isles. And he, by God's grace, that was an effective um, uh, ministry, establishing um, the Christian faith, eventually uh, Ethelbert, the, uh, the king of the Kents, converted and allowed a monastery to be established. And this uh, fragmentary stuff in the foreground is the monastery that was established by Augustine and continued to serve 
um, and eventually, um, as you well know, perhaps, uh, because that was the first of these monasteries established to bringing the faith to all of the British Isles, when eventually Henry VIII makes the Church of England to be separate from the Church, Church of Rome, um, centuries later, um, the Archbishop of the Church of England would be the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, and since we have a number of very fine musicians here, I'll try to not play the hand here too heavy. Um, Gregory was a great musician, and uh, frequently medieval chant has been referred to as Gregorian chant, and I understand from musicologists that that's probably an overstatement. He collated uh, chant that had previously been, Ambrose, for example, established chant way back in the time before, the, 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 the one who was Bishop of Milan, who was instrumental in his preaching in converting Augustine, Augustine of Hippo. Um, so, at least we can say that Gregory uh, wanted to structure all aspects of the liturgy of the church, including the music, and he was a great music lover. And so um, that's another of his accomplishments, which is um, recorded in this illustration, which is from a, um, an antiphonary. Uh, you know, part of the beauty of the chant would be antiphonal reflecting the way that the Psalter is composed. A uh, Hebrew poetry has um, strophes. Uh, a statement is made and then a counter statement or a complementary statement is made. So this antiphonal structure to the Psalms himself is often inflected into the, the kind of worship that Gregory and others saw in the fifth in the church. And I think with that we've covered monasticism and papacy, but you know, obviously there's some continuity and we'll escape from lesson six to get to today's lesson which is dealing with the church and the state as these two, uh, two bodies uh, that sometimes come in conflict in the ensuing years. Uh, and we're going to be, just a reminder about some of the geography of what we're talking about. We just looked at um, the Monastery of St. Gall, which is in present-day Switzerland. You know, these names of countries that we are familiar with are, you know, for our benefit, not necessarily how they were referred to in those times. But here's St. Gall. Um, uh, we, uh, Benedict was from Nursia, which is just uh, north of Rome a little bit. Um, Aquileia, where the, um, where the Arians were being allowed into the services, were, is up here in the northeast of Italy. Um, we're going to be looking at this, once the, uh, the mission that Augustine of Kent uh, brought to the great British Isles. Um, it was effective in spreading the gospel all across what we would know as the British Great Britain. And so we'll, we'll be looking momentarily at some monasteries that were established, um, which were devoted to copying scriptures, among other things. Lindisfarne is one of those. Um, Iona, off the coast of Scotland, is another. So it seems that those become some places, but there was also monasteries established all across uh, British Isles. Uh, we'll also see um, a continuing work um, when Charlemagne, we'll be getting to Charlemagne when the Holy Roman Empire is reestablished. Charlemagne establishes his capital in Aachen, which is the very western part of present day Germany, across the river from the Netherlands, across the river Maas from the Netherlands. And we'll take a picture, we'll see some pictures of Aachen. Uh, what else we're we going to see? We're going to see one of the bishops that uh, Charlemagne saw to it was appointed bishop of Olean is uh, Theodolf, and we'll look at his his uh, chapel at one of his residences, which is here, just south of Olean, where he was bishop. Well, all of this is in a PowerPoint that the pastor has sent in the in this flock notes. So if you want to, I recognize you can't see all these things in detail from where you are, or if you're listening out over the airwaves out there, you can um, go to the flock note and find this material. And here's evidence of the conversion of the Anglo-Saxons. Um, and, and, and we have evidence to written evidence of one of the great historians from English history is the Venerable Bede. 
um, who, who wrote about this success of Gregory's mission. Uh, he writes, um, great numbers gathered each day to hear the word of God, forsaking their heathen rites and entering in the unity of Christ's holy church as believers. Here you see the Wilton Cross, which dates from 675, so that's what, uh, less than a century after Gregory has brought Christianity to Kent. Uh, not that Gregory was the first, we'll see in a moment, uh, Patrick was already at it a century earlier, or a century or two earlier. But here we see the Wilton Cross, which is essentially um, the, the skill of these um, early medieval artisans is evident in the four arms of this cross. What it circumscribes is a Byzantine coin, which has a cross on it. And, and I think Byzantium was the sort of stronghold of Christianity. So finding a gold coin, which they didn't use for buying things, they put it around, they made it into a medallion that would be worn around his neck. It, it looks like it's upside down, but if this is where it's around your neck, it would be so that it would inspire the, the person uh, wearing it. Um, as I mentioned, um, the Benedictines included writing of scripture was an important manual. Benedict thought that the whole day should be structured for eight times in the day and night, that worship should be done collectively as the monks uh, sing praise to God, as Psalm 8 encouraged all of us to do. Um, but in other parts of the day, they were to do manual labor, you know, to raise food, but also to copy scripture. So scriptoria were often a part of these Benedictine monasteries. And sure enough, uh, one that was established in 634 by St. Adion, I, I guess would be my guess at his name's pronunciation, as early as 634, a monastery was established here where scripture was copied. And um, the building that you see is much later from the 11th or 12th century. Actually, it's a Norman structure. And later in the, in the in the uh, class in the month of June, we only have four Sundays left, but we'd like to talk about the influence of the Normans. And uh, one of the things that William the Conqueror wanted to do was to show that he was a godly emperor, Christian emperor, as he conquered. He didn't want to feel like he had vanquished the English, but rather had brought Christianity to a higher level. And so the structure that you see here is Norman construction from the 11th and 12th century. Here's a closer detail of it. But, but the point is, that when this structure is built, the monastery has already been established and been working there for well, 600 years. And from that monastery, this is well before the Normans came. In fact, this is very within 60 years after the establishment of the monastery. They're producing um, sophisticated um, books uh, containing the Gospels. And this is the, the cross page from the Lindisfarne Gospels. You know, the first page, you know, make this cross that we, you know, celebrate Christian, the Christian faith. And this is a detail of this little section here. And see how skillful. And, and this, a lot of this intricacy is part of the aesthetic of the Anglo-Saxons prior to their conversion. But now they're using it in the service of Christ. And similarly, from another um, monastery, this is one from, um, done from... Uh, Iona, the island off the west coast of Scotland, uh, known as the Book of Kells. Uh, this is the opening page to the Gospel of Matthew, which begins with the genealogy of Christ. So the first word, Christ, in the Latin is um, seen with the Cairo, and, and that's how, that, this is the Cairo. Again, the same kind of interest, this is the detail over here that we're looking at. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Augustine of Kent did a good thing in bringing Christianity to that, the, the king of Kent. But already um, centuries earlier, uh, Patrick, who was actually a native of England, had been trained in France, but came to bring Christianity to Ireland. And um, we have a few of Irish descent in the audience here, so I hope we can rejoice in the fact that Patrick did some wonderful things. Um, and here we see him baptize, well, in the process of baptizing um, King Angus of Cashiel. Apparently he inadvertently stabbed his, um, his mitre on his foot when he was praying. Uh, he emphatically brought his mitre down and stabbed him in the foot. 
the record of an eyewitness, one of his trainee monks said, he said his, his mouth went agape as this occurred, but the king thought maybe this is part of the ceremony. I'll just take it, uh, I'll just take it in, in, in silence. And uh, Patrick didn't realize what he had done until he opened his eyes from his prayer and brought him into the, into the uh, basin of water to baptize him. So there you have the little tidbits from the, uh, the life of Patrick. The point being that he was converting pagans. And the pagans were so embracing Christianity, they even did it without, uh, without complaining. <laughs> um, this missionary uh, energy that is generated in, as, as the Benedicts spread Christianity throughout the, the British Isles, they don't stop there, but they begin to send missionaries to Northern Europe that was still in pagan, um, in conducting pagan worship. And so we have Boniface, who is a, a native of England and a Benedictine monk, who goes, initially he goes to um, the Frisians, which would be in present day um, Holland, and he was rejected there. The first couple years of his efforts were failed. But not to give up, he went back home and then decided, well, let's try the, the Germans, the, the Hessians. He went to present day Germany and he was successful. He was a very colorful um, missionary using dramatic methods. Before a group of hostile pagan Hessians, he cut down a sacred oak tree dedicated to Thor. They waited for Thor to strike Boniface dead. Instead, a gust of wind toppled the tree, breaking it into four pieces. The deeply impressed pagans built a place, built it into, breaking it into four pieces, the deeply impressed pagans built a place of a prayer dedicated to St. Peter on the very spot. Uh, because of his ability and loyalty to Rome, Boniface was first made bishop and then archbishop of Mans. He remained a missionary, however, and continued to establish new outposts and centers of learning. The greatest of these was the monastery at Fulda. Um, as an old man in his 70s, Boniface returned to the scene of his original efforts to the Frisians. At first, he was successful on this second attempt baptizing thousands, but in 754, a disgruntled band of pagans killed him. And here you see in a manuscript, actually coming from the, um, well, from the, the monastery that he established late in his career. A sacramentarium would be a, a book showing how orders of the services should be conducted, you know, particularly when the sacrament of the Lord's Supper is celebrated, what kind of prayers and Order should be done. This is a manuscript illustrating his martyrdom, a manuscript coming from one of the monasteries that he established. Is there, you know, is there a significance to his robe being ripped? Um, I don't. Is it being ripped? It's I, ripped and he's exposed. He's naked underneath it. This is his white robe, isn't it? Yes. And just, if you move your finger up, you see his body, his, 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 his hip, and, and his arm, bare, bare I, arm? I, I think that that's meant to be his robe. That's, that's a robe on top of his, his white garment. As a Benedictine, he would wear a white um, robe. But as a bishop, he would have a chasuble. So it's, I think, showing his office. Um, you're seeing things, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that's my take on it. Um, you know, there's one detail that I forgot to mention about um, Patrick. You know, Patrick himself was royal to, loyal to Rome. But the, as he established Christianity in Ireland, the, the Celtic Christians in Ireland did not accept the authority of Rome. And that in itself created potential conflict, which was resolved at the Synod of Whitby in 663. And here's what Roberts writes about that. Uh, because of its superior organization and the general pro-Roman sentiment of most Anglo-Saxons, the Roman church went out in this potential tension as both are sending missionaries around Great Britain, um, the, 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 the um, Synod of Whitby resolved and brought together what would have been otherwise competing Christian groups. And I mention that because it's good in the midst of the conflict that we're going to see that God does oftentimes graciously intercede and, and bring about resolution. Um, as we thought about the missionary activity going to Germany and to Holland and to Great Britain, um, 
what will become France, it isn't, none of these are modern nations as we know them now, but is, we can think about the territory in Europe uh, that would be modern day France. The, the, the group of uh, Germanic uh, Frankish tribes, Fra Frank, the Franks were a Germanic tribe, but they eventually settled in the area of present day France. The first of these um, to convert was Clovis who lived from 466 approximately to 511 and um, was converted to Catholicism, th that is to the Roman church, the Orthodox church, not the Arian church, which many of the pagan, uh, many of the German, Germanic tribes had been converted to an Arian version of Christianity, a, a non-Orthodox conversion. His conversion in 496 was followed by his baptism on Christmas day in 508. Um, Here's what Roberts writes about Clovis. He became an Orthodox Christian as opposed to Arianism of most other Germanic tribes, loyal to the papacy and brought his tribe into the church. The king and his successors tended to treat the church as their own property. They made royal approval and a requirement for anyone seeking ordination as a priest and determined which priests were eligible to be elected bishop by the clergy of a diocese. The popes, however, were too busy in Italy to do battle over these matters. And perhaps the Frankish king sensed and the popes agreed that without the control of the church, they could not rule their realm. So from 500 to 700, this society was essentially sacral in character. And what I think Frank Roberts means by sacral is that um, the whole of society believed itself to be under, under God. There wasn't a separation of political and ecclesiastical. The two were one. Um, another um, of these Frankish um, leaders who was helpful to Christianity in some form is um, the uh, military man and statesman uh, uh, Charles Martel, who um, who in 732 defeated the West the advance of the Muslims into Western Europe. The Muslims had control of Spain. They tried to extend that further, and they were defeated by Charles Martel in the Battle of Poitiers. Sometimes it's referred to as the Battle of Tours because the battle actually took place between those two um, French cities. And here, his defense of Christianity in, in, by military means is depicted by the great 19th century muralist, Puvi de Chavon. And, and interestingly, this, this uh, mural showing um, Martel's accomplishments. It's not at a church, it's in the city hall of Poitiers, the, the Hotel de Ville would be the city hall. And, and so it was like a part of the civic accomplishment of that city would be it's maintaining the Christian faith of the, of the Western Europe. Um, a little bit later, another um, Frankish king, Pippin the Short. Am I saying his name correctly, Pippin. Pippin. Okay, good, we have a better speaker than me here. Um, Pepin the Short decided to seize the scepter in 752 to prevent possible rebellion by the landed nobility and to gain church sanction of his action. He took a momentous step. He appealed to the Pope, asking him to decide who should be king. That politically sagacious um, church leader responded by saying it was better for the man who had power, namely Pepin, to be king. This act set a new state in church-state relations, relations. By appealing to the Pope, Pepin seemed to be conceding the papacy's right to determine who held secular power. As if to confirm this, Boniface, the Pope's representative, Subsequently, um, Charlemagne is one of the greatest of these Frankish kings, so, so much so that he, um, and again, I'm going to read this to try to make it be efficient. Um, Charlemagne's uh, effort to be an effective ruler was given fresh impetus and direction by a change in the concepts of the purpose of government and of the role of monarchs. That change led to a grafting of religious component into onto the traditional somewhat narrow conception of the basis of royal authority. 
drawing on the Old Testament and the teachings of St. Augustine of Hippo on the nature of the city of God, Charlemagne and his advisors progressively saw the king's position as bestowed by God for the purpose of realizing the divine, divine plan for the universe. Kingship, kingship took on a ministerial dimension, which obligated the ruler to assume responsibility for both the spiritual and the material well-being of his subjects. This new role entailed a vast expansion of traditional royal authority and a redefinition of the priorities that government should serve. I want to say quickly here, um, it's not fair to blame Augustine of Hippo for what's happening. Augustine wrote the City of God and dedicated it. If you remember when we mentioned it, he wrote to a Marcellinus. He was answering the objections of one Marcellinus. You know, the complaint seems to be that Rome is falling now that we're worshiping a Christian God. And it goes without saying, if, if Christ said, love your enemies and do good to those that hate you, that's not going to maintain a military control over any uh, empire. And Augustine was writing that to Marcellinus, who was not a churchman. He was, he was a, a civic ruler who was a Christian, but his, his, his office was not one in the church. And the difficulty, uh, um, uh, scholars have pointed out, is that that educated laity to which Augustine was addressing the city of God disappeared within a hundred years of his writing the book. So on, you know, unbeknownst to Augustine and not in his control, what he wrote became a, taken up by monks and by the church and used it for their purposes, which were a far cry from what Augustine had attended. And if you remember, and I don't have it in front of me, but a couple weeks ago when we covered Augustine, we, we read how he, how he described a good Christian ruler and it was one who is humble and seeks to control himself rather than to control others and consciously um, gives honor and obedience and confession of his own limitations to to god whom he serves that's a far cry from what we're going to see playing out here so um i, I just wanted to make that qualification before we go too much further um, here's what roberts has to say about charlemagne even though Charlemagne had accepted the imperial crown from the Pope, he did not consider himself in any way subordinate to him. By virtue of his anointing as king and emperor, Charlemagne believed that he had been placed in authority over the church and state. He considered himself the equal of David and Solomon, the one empowered to be, quote, the representatives of God in the leadership of the church, not only in external, but also in, in internal affairs, end quote. As such, he stood above bishops and felt free to reject the Pope's advice. He called 33 councils to deal with problems of discipline in the church. He reformed lax monasteries, which is good. He imposed the Benedictine rule once again, which also was great benefit. He imposed uniform dress on the Western clergy. He reformed the church music and liturgy. Fortunately, these reforms were conducted with full papal support, and for the most part, were beneficial to both the church and the empire. Char and this is Robert's continuing, Charlemagne's, Charlemagne's theological decisions created more tension. As the head of the church, he had no qualms whatever about his ability, his ability to alter important creeds and to make theological decisions that seemed to run counter to the broader wisdom of the church. And I don't want to go into a lot of detail on it, but the Philippe clause in the creed as it's recited in the West is because of his insertion. And he was warned by the Pope, that's going to not sit well with the East. Um, and indeed it didn't. And so he sort of went against the vice of the Pope there and just established that on his own. And for the most part, he was a good master, uh, Robert's writes, genuinely concerned with the church's welfare. He made use of Christian missions in expanding his kingdom. He brought missionaries along on his battles with the pagan German tribes. The conquered had a choice, death or baptism. Thousands chose death. But other thousands, quote unquote, converted. Probably reasoning, what does it profit a man, what does it profit a man to have his own way and lose his life? 
Charlemagne found it necessary to abandon Boniface's peaceful missionary methods in favor of forced conversions because missionary activity was an integral part of his wars of conquest. He reasoned that those who refused to convert were, by the very act, proven rebels, and rebels deserve to die. Such reasoning is typical of the logical but disastrous results of combining church and state, interlocking questions of faith with those of political obedience. That's a Frank Roberts sort of giving critique of essentially saying uh, Charlemagne did wonderful things, and, and that's undeniable, but there's some, you know, with every bright light, there is a shadow cast, and this is the shadow in, in terms of Charlemagne's reign. But just to show you a little bit of detail here, this is um, the, the palace that he established in Aachen. The, the chapel of the palace is in the center, and it was designed by one Otto of Metz, a German architect who had traveled uh, significantly, traveled to Ravenna to see um, one of the resplendent Byzantine churches there from the early sixth century, San Vitale. San Vitale is an octagonal church, as were many of the Eastern churches, uh, Hagia Sophia being one of the most significant, but others in, in Constantinople that have not survived were much like this one of San Vitale, and that's the model that Otto of Metz used for establishing this uh, chapel as part of the palace in Aachen. You can see this correlation more directly, I think, with the interior shots here. This is the, uh, the interior of this octagonal chapel in Aachen, and here's the counterpart, in, the earlier counterpart in San Vitale. This picture is taken from the apse. Um, there is an apse even in a centrally organized church. And this is the apse looking in this direction. And, and you know, as, as was suggested by Robert's comments, um, you know, Charlemagne saw to it that his that he appointed bishops that were favorable to his his rule and friends of him. And one such bishop was Theodore of Orléans. He became the he was previously a Benedictine monk and um, had been the head of a Benedictine monastery uh, on the River Loire, not far from Olean. And it's there that, and, but he was also an educational reformer. Um, he was, as, as was, Charlemagne was not himself literate, but he recognized the importance of literacy and, and the Benedictines were able to help fulfill that. And so here we see um, an oratory, which was essentially his private chapel on his sort of like vacation residence. Um, uh, about 30 kilometers outside of Olean on the River Loire. And it has in it, and again, show the, the way that the West is esteeming in the East. We, we saw the Walton Cross, which had a Byzantine coin. Even here in Charlemagne's time in 806, this oratory that Bishop Theodolf erected essentially for his, his household's worship um, has a Byzantine mosaic of the Ark of the Covenant. And interestingly, Theodore actually wrote on a defense of imagery using the Ark as one of the Old Testament examples of God using imagery in, in at least the decoration of the, uh, the Ark. Um, this contribution that Charlemagne made and the Benedictine order helped fulfill it towards education is further sustained. Um, we, we have wonderful manuscripts coming from these Benedictine monasteries. We looked at St. Gall to start today. Here's actually a, a manuscript the Lindau Gospels that came out of that, monast that Benedictine monastery. Very beautifully done. And another point to be made here, as part of Charlemagne's educational reforms and eagerness to spread Christianity throughout his empire, was the um, standardization of writing. As each of these monasteries had their own scriptoria, and from one generation to the next, they would just keep copying master examples from their own monastery, there would be a degeneration of, of, of the letter forms. You know, shorthand might come in or just you know fancy modifications so that eventually they would become illegible to one another even though they were all written in Latin. And so recognizing the limitation of that, Charlemagne drew upon his, his scribe, Alison of York, who of York, that means he was from England. Uh, he was actually, as we learned today from Psalm 8, that even the praise of infants is to be heard for God. Um, 
the Benedictines and in, in, in England took that seriously and they trained young children to sing praise. York was one of those, those um, places of, of choir training for young, young, young boys, eight years and up. And since our son Andrew's here, he was trained in that tradition, <laughs> as was his sister Clara, and, and as was Anitra Central here in Rochester, a cathedral choir. Uh, perform that function. But what the benefit that was, at eight years old, he was learning Latin, so he could sing it in the choir. So he knew Latin. So when Charlemagne needed a scribe to, to fulfill his educational task, he brought Alison of York to Aachen to serve him. And what Alison did is he established a, a lowercase letter, a minuscule, to facilitate the efficient writing of manuscripts. There was no upper and lower case prior to this, and that's part of the clumsiness of letters becoming deformed so they couldn't be read from one group to another. So the fact that we have two, an upper and lower case, and the lower case letters are largely the initiation of a standardization, it's referred to as the Carolingian minuscule, or the Carolingian little letter. And you can see an example of it here from uh, a ninth century manuscript. And our, we're getting almost to the end here. The uh, most challenging part of this lesson is the investiture controversy. Um, Charlemagne's um, success did not extend to his uh, his children and grandchildren. His son, um, Louis the Pious, eventually went into civil war against Louis the Pious, his three sons. And um, eventually that split up what had been the unified Western Europe under Charlemagne's reign. And it becomes divided into at least three divisions. This looks like four, and maybe initially it was four because of this struggle between Louis and his three sons. But eventually, the green and the orange area would become the Holy Roman Emperor Empire, and the West will eventually eventually become France. The yellow will become Poland and Hungary. And um, our time is up. Um, this is the nasty part of the lesson, anyway. So maybe it's best to leave it out. But um, the you know, part of the difficulty here is with the Holy Roman Empire and also a pope, you know, and, and in a society in which everyone believes that God has ordained all that is, and including the structure of society. So if you're a, a vassal, you're obedient to your Lord because that's what God would have you be because he's placed you in that position. And that works its way all the way up the ladder to who's in charge of the church and who's in charge of the state. And so the question becomes, is it the state or the church that is, has the ultimate authority? Well, ultimately, God, they would all say God has the ultimate authority, but who's he given it to on earth? And there's lots of interesting, um, well, there's at least two dominant views. You know, if you're the pope, you can say the pope's the one who's in charge of everything. <clears throat> if you're the emperor, you can say otherwise. So that was the controversy. We'll look at that next week at my God's grace. Thank you for your attention. I do want to close with a prayer. So um, if you could stand with me, and we'll conclude our class with a prayer. <laughs> Almighty God, we give you thanks that you have indeed preserved your church in spite of the fact that we are all sinful and willful creatures eager to glorify ourselves rather than to bring glory to you. And so even as we see these struggles of power, political, and ecclesiastical. We thank you that in the midst of this, you seem fit to correct and to um, um, bring the church in, in line when we've gotten out of line. So we thank you for this, your promise to pro protect and preserve the church. Or, or without that, we realize we would do a great disaster. And so we pray you would protect our church and keep us faithful to you, humble, in acknowledging that our, we are quick to, to seek our own glory and not yours. We pray all this in Christ's name and to his glory. Amen. Thank you. I could have some able-bodied men take out some of the plastic.